All right, everyone. Um, I think we should go ahead and get started. Thank you uh, for joining us um, for this month's In Dialogue program. Um, you can see um, up on the screen that um, we are just asking everyone to go ahead and um, let us know where you're attending from in the chat. Um, and then respond to the warm up question that we have on the screen. What does it mean for a person to have agency? So to kick us off, um, I'll just introduce myself first. My name is Brianna White. Um, I'm the head of education for the National Portrait Gallery. My colleagues will introduce themselves over the next few minutes. Um, but I just wanted to tell you a little bit about um, our program this evening um, and talk a little bit about some of the logistical things um, that we have going on. Um, so this month in Dialogue, Smithsonian Objects and Social Justice Program, um, it's a collaborative program that is hosted by educators from the National Portrait Gallery, along with colleagues from across the Smithsonian. This month's program, we are so lucky to be joined by wonderful colleagues from the Freer and Sackler Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art. It is our intention with this program to explore civic awareness through conversations about art, history, and material culture, and to discuss how both historical and contemporary objects from our collections speak to today's social justice issues. You probably already saw when you joined our program, but this program will be recorded. If you turn your camera on, the video feed from your device may be captured on the recording and used for Smithsonian purposes. Take care to conceal from view and not share material that is private, sensitive, or confidential. We will ask you to remain muted for the program today and to engage with us via the chat box during our program this evening. Tonight's program includes a sign language interpreter. Um, you can pin the interpreter. You right click on the three dots in the upper right corner of the interpreter's box and to ensure that the window remains on your screen. In addition, this program is also being automatically transcribed. To turn the captions on or off, toggle over the CC or closed caption button on your Zoom window. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Kaia Black. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kaya Black. I work on special projects and programs for the National Portrait Gallery. Um, I want to start the program off by making a land acknowledgement, which states, although we're getting together today from different places, we gratefully acknowledge the native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather as well as the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their home here today. We also recognize that since this nation's founding, who is represented and how one is represented reflects the country's flaws as well as its strengths. The National Portrait Gallery strives to present a more complete narrative, one that acknowledges the history of slavery, racism, and inequality in the United States. Let's also take this time to briefly acknowledge the continued impact of racism on people of color through systems of oppression and racial violence, including police brutality, public acts of xenophobia, and anti-Asian racism. And I am going now to pass this on to my colleagues, Grace and Sai, so that they can introduce themselves. Hi everyone, thanks Kaya and Brianna for that introduction. My name is Grace Murray. Um, I'm from the Public Programs Department at the Freer and Sackler Galleries, the National Museum of Asian Art. Hi everyone, my name is Sai Mudasani and I manage social media at the Freer and Sackler. Good evening.
I think Vanessa is now going to take us through our community norms. So take it away, Vanessa. Yes. Hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Vanessa Jones, and I am an educator here at the National Portrait Gallery, and I'm very happy to be here with all of you tonight. So let's just take a moment to, to ensure that we all create a safe space um, for us to have this conversation today. And um, I just want to point out some of our community norms. Respect others and their opinions. Consider your own privacy and that of others. Avoid inappropriate material and statements. Cyberbullying will not be tolerated. Be present, patient, patient, and compassionate. And remember that we all come to this conversation uh, with different lived experiences, perspectives, and ideas. And even though we might disagree, we can learn, learn from each other and build community. Thank you, Vanessa. So when everyone first joined us, we asked you to respond to a warm-up question, which is, what does it mean for a person to have agency? Um, so I'm going to ask Vanessa to help me call out a few of your answers from the chat. Um, while she does that, um, I just want to share individual agency is when a person acts on their own behalf. Agency is defined as the capacity of individuals to act independently and to make their own free choices. So let's hear um, some of your responses. So I see someone who said that agency is to be seen and heard, to be acknowledged. It's a relationship. That's great. Um, let's see. For a person to have agency, the individual needs to be recognized as a member of society or a subgroup. And I'll share one more. I think agency means having as many choices as the average person, not having options cut off from you. So thanks, everyone. I really like that idea of a two-way exchange and also being seen. Um, so that leads us to the question that's gonna guide our conversation tonight, which is why does agency and representation matter? So we will explore this key question in relationship to a 1937 photograph of actress Anna Mae Wong and an early 21st century photo performance by Pushpamala N. Great, thank you, Sai. Um, so to kick us off, um, to start off our conversation, we are going to take a close look um, with this portrait um, of Anna Mae Wong that was uh, created by Nicholas Murray in 1937. I'm going to start off by giving you um, a little bit of biographical information about Anna Mae Wong, but as I do, um, I'd like you to take a few moments and look closely at this particular photograph. Um, and I'd like you to let your eye wander over the image from top to bottom, side to side, all around, um, and really take in what we call um, the elements of portrayal of the portrait. And when I say elements of portrayal, I mean, um, the setting, the clothing, the hairstyle, the pose or the posture, the medium, which as we know is a photograph in this case, the scale of the individual within the, um, within the portrait, um, color and what role color plays. Um, and I'd like you to Note your initial observations that you have about this work in the chat while I tell you just a little bit um, about Anna Mae Wong. So she was born on January 3rd, 1905 in Los Angeles. She is a legendary Asian American actress. She began her Hollywood career during um, Hollywood's silent era. She appeared in such classics as The Red Lantern in 1919, when she was just 14 years old, Toll of the Sea, which was an early Technicolor film, and The Thief of Baghdad. She successfully made the transition to talking pictures, and her role opposite Marlena Dietrich in Shanghai Express made her an international star. 
And I'm so struck by the fact that she left a legacy of some 60 films throughout her career. So I'm hoping that um, both Vanessa and Kaya can help me uh, call out some of the initial observations that you um, that you had about um, about this image. What are we seeing in the chat? Um, so someone mentioned that um, red is a prominent color in the photograph. Um, she is holding um, uh, a paper um, or a fan behind her head. Uh, she, she seems to look somewhat submissive. Uh, she's definitely looking away from uh, the viewer with her eyes kind of downcast, um, definitely not direct eye contact. Um, and, and someone did actually mention her clothing, what she has on, um, that her dress uh, seems to be of Chinese origin with embroidered dragons. Okay, excellent. So um, I'm noticing with all of these observations that you really are taking in those elements of portrayal, thinking about her pose, the fact that her eyes are cast downward, she's not engaging with us, the viewer. Um, there are a lot of responses about um, what it is that she's wearing, um, as well as the accessories that we see within this image. Um, and then we are certainly struck by the background because it, it, it's a hint of something, but we can't quite make out all of the details. And we'll talk a little bit more um, about the background in just a little bit. So what additional observations are you seeing based on these initial, um, I guess, elements and observations that you all are having. Anything else come up for you as we continue to talk about what we see? And Vanessa, please feel free to chime in. Um, with sure, so in the chat. yeah, so we have a comment that Anna Mae Wong appears perfectly made up with her haircut and her eyebrows. Um, and of course, her traditional uh, her traditional dressing dress. Um, someone notes that it seems more of an American idea of what a Chinese dress would look like, and she seems to be reminiscent and longing for something. Okay, okay, excellent. Um, Kaya, I know that you um, had done some research. Um, on her clothing. Will you tell us a little bit about, um, about what you read about what Anna Mae Wong is wearing? Sure. Um, so in this photograph, um, it depicts Anna Mae Wong from the waist up. Um, and it, perhaps she might be wearing what is known as a chong sam or a chi pao, um, which was a long gown that was first worn by the Manchu women, which dated back to the Qing dynasty, uh, which was the last dynasty in China from 1644 to 1912. Um, Chang Sams have since evolved into a more form-fitting gown with high necklines that were um, very popularized during the 1930s and the 1940s. But um, I think there are instances, obviously, that people still wear them today. Um, and some of the symbolism found in this Chang Sam um, is uh, traditionally uh, related to Chinese culture. Um, for one, the color yellow was considered an imperial color, um, which generally represented power. Um, that also represented royalty and prosperity. And what's interesting here too, that um, Wang's Chinese birth name was Wang Lu Song, which can be translated to mean frosted yellow willows. So um, 
it, it might be inferring that, um, you know, she felt connected to her, her Chinese name in relation to possibly wearing the color yellow uh, during this photograph. Thank you, Kaia. And that actually leads me perfectly into um, my next question for everyone, which is um, we've spent some time observing what it is uh, that we see. Um, and now I'd like to shift us into what sorts of um, inferences can we make based on those initial observations? But in addition to that, what sorts of wonderings um, questions do you have um, about, about this portrait? And I had noticed when I was just scrolling through the chat that um, Sherry mentioned, um, she wondered about the hairstyle and if it was typical of this particular era um, or if it was, or if it would be considered um, a Chinese hairstyle. So I think that um, I would love for everyone to some jot some uh, ways that you're interpreting this portrait along with um, questions that you might have um, into the chat for us to uh, dig a little bit um, a little bit deeper. Um, and I am just looking through the chat because I had noticed early on that someone had um, interpreted her expression. Um, yes, that it looks as if she um, might look submissive in this portrait. And I'm wondering what other ways we might be able to interpret um, Anna Mae Wong's expression in this piece. So Vanessa, if you could help me with the chat. There's, I see an expression of um, longing perhaps. Um, and a very important question, what image or message does this portrait try and sell, especially um, in this particular moment? Right, someone's wondering, you know, what's she hiding? Um, her makeup and, and look disguises her feelings and the, the, fa the fan hides her background. Right, and a question, right, relating back to um, our guiding question for the day, which is, you know, really, we can begin to wonder as we look at this piece and have a conversation about it, how much agency did Wong have um, in, in this representation? And not only that, but how, um, how much collaboration perhaps was happening between Nicholas Murray and Anna Mae Wong to have, um, to have this particular piece photographed. All right. So thank you for all of your observations, your interpretations, your wonderings. Hang on to those wonderings um, over the course of you know, the next 40 minutes that we're together because I think that they'll, they'll keep coming back. Um, and I think that some of those wonderings might get answered and some of them uh, might not necessarily. Um, but what I'd like to do now is um, really turn our attention to this moment in time, um, to Hollywood in the 1930s and how film stars such as Anna Mae Wong and others were being portrayed. Um, and I pose this question to all of you, when you think of 1930s Hollywood glamor, what ideas come to mind? And I think that, you know, some of that Hollywood glamour, um, you know, we've definitely seen coming through um, in the chat as we were having our initial um, conversation about observations. So what ideas come to mind when you think of 1930s Hollywood glamour? So 
Sorry about that, everyone. The golden age of glamour for women's fashion, the strong contrast, glitz and sparkle and sleek. I love those words just all put together. Yeah, and someone, Brianna, looks like they added in the chat, um, they mentioned the makeup of the era, um, referenced uh, Marlena Dietrich's uh, eyebrows um, and her makeup. Um, so this is actually a good segue into, um, you know, what we will be talking about next, this idea of um, Hollywood in the 1930s and how film, film stars were portrayed. Are there any other um, uh, chat responses, Vanessa, that people may have before we talk more about the era? Yeah, people are noticing, um, the same thing I was thinking about is, um, the extent to which women were objectified um, and that, you know, they had very restrictive roles um, in Hollywood in that time and, and uh, how they, they needed to be portrayed as extremely feminine and, you know, beautiful in a certain way. Right. And two, um, two notes in the chat box came up for me too. Um, one is uh, the women are looking highly stylized mm -hmm. um, and then uh, highly crafted, right? Uh, not, a, not a hair out of place, makeup just perfect, um, very particular clothing. But yeah, I would love to hear more about about this era. I know that you did you did a ton of work um, learning about, about Hollywood glamour of the 1930s. And I think it'll help us set the stage for this idea of um, agency and in, in representation. Right, sure. So um, the 1930s were considered the height of Hollywood's golden years. The film and movie industry boomed. It was one of the largest businesses in the country, spurring, spurring the popularity of fashion photography. Um, the industry offered an escape during the Great Depression. And at the height of the industry, it is said that more than 80 million people watched at least one film a week. And um, stars and startlets were seen on billboards and advertisements and women's fashion reached its peak. Paris still dominated fashion, but other cities like London and New York became epicenters while Hollywood offered um, escapism, glamor and beauty on screen. And what's interesting enough is that while capitalism fell during the depression, fashion and glamour excelled. Um, and then you see also this idea of ready to wear versions of glamorous outfits um, that were worn on screen that were uh, trendy. And um, more and more you saw women having sewing patterns made available. So there really was this democratization of fashion. Um, makeup changed and uh, I think someone else mentioned in the chat earlier, this idea of overly plucked pencil thin eyebrows, um, that certainly was in vogue. And certainly this idea of, um, you know, red matching lipstick with red nail polish, which was very fashionable in the era, which we also can uh, make out in Wong's uh, photograph here of her. Um, and it's interesting because during the uh, 19th century and the early 1900s, really wearing uh, lipstick uh, during the day was uh, um, frowned upon at that moment. But in the 30s, wearing lipstick and makeup during the day was really no longer frowned upon. Um, and uh, let's talk a little also about um, who the photographer was. Um, so Nicholas Murray was one of the many photographers documenting people of the era. Uh, he produced over 10,000 photographs during his career, 
um, of, of 20 years. Um, he was born Miklos Mandel. Uh, he was a Jewish Hungarian American who immigrated to the United States at the age of 20 in 1913 to escape rising anti-Semitism and the impending threat of World War I. And to assimilate like many Jewish immigrants at the time, he changed his name to Nicholas Murray and he took classes to uh, learn English um, and to quickly get rid of his accent. Um, he was working in a printing shop in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, but um, he ended up opening a photography studio in Greenwich Village in New York City. Um, and in 1920, he landed his first break uh, photographing Florence Reed, uh, who was a Broadway and film actress for Harper's Bazaar. And soon after that, he really became the photographer who shot anyone who was anybody, ranging from film actors, literary figures, athletes, politicians, dancers. Um, and he really became uh, the creme de la creme um, during that time period. And I think, um, I think, you know, given, given all, uh, given all of what you just said about, you know, the Hollywood, Hollywood in 1930s, you know, we can begin to see ways, right, that Murray is um, idealizing beauty and conveying glamour um, in this portrait. Kaya, what are some of the ways that are standing out to you um, about that? Um, so when I look at this photograph um, by Murray, um, to me, the way he idealized beauty and conveyed glamour was in a few ways. Um, for one, what immediately jumps out to me is the staging and the positioning of the sitter, um, how Anna Mae Wong uh, fills the frame of the image um, with her graceful pose. Um, I should also note that um, when she was a teenager, she actually was a fur model. So you, you can see that perhaps she knows how to use her body when she's photographed. Um, her arms are also uh, softly holding the fan at an angle as well. Um, obviously, um, with Murray being a photographer, um, you know, lighting is a big part. So she is uh, lit from the front uh, with, the, with the lighting highlighting the delicacy of her hands while she's holding the fan. Um, and also, um, you know, it's, it's definitely a stylized image. Um, she is definitely made up, um, you know, with her, with her uh, earrings, um, her red lips, her red nails, um, you know, she's all put together. So these are kind of some of the ways that um, I think Murray did kind of capture a, a glamour in this portrait. Thanks, Kaya. And can you, um, could you take a couple of minutes and just tell us a little bit more about um, Anna Mae Wong, so we can consider the, the really the agency that she had in her life before we um, transition over to our colleagues um, at Freer Sackler to talk about um, the uh, Yogini image. Sure, so um, Anna Mae Wong's career started early, as I think you mentioned earlier, Brianna, um, she was around 14 years old and her career lasted surprisingly over 40 years. Um, she was often depicted on screen as a seductress, as a dragon lady um, in um, subservient roles. And um, at the time, the perception of Asians uh, were that they were uh, cunning and evil, along with other archetypes of Asian women as being exotic, submissive, conniving, and threatening, which were very much harmful misrepresentations that were projected in the media and in Hollywood. 
Uh, while many Americans looked down on most immigrants, the Chinese were uh, considered racially and culturally inferior and um, unable to assimilate. This same attitude impacted Hollywood uh, and lead roles for Asian Americans were not given to Asians, but to white actors and yellow face. And um, I do wanna uh, take a little step back to kind of set the stage for what was happening and where this discrimination was coming from. Um, so in the 1850s with the gold rush, there was a growing fear of Chinese immigration. Uh, many Chinese laborers and farmers came over to escape the political and economic turmoil in China due to the opium, opium wars. And in 1882, the U.S. sought to limit immigration and citizenship with the Chinese Exclusion Acts. And um, these policies uh, surprisingly lasted over 80 years, well into the 20th century. Um, Chinese immigrants had limited rights and were considered a threat to American culture and the economy. And this racialized fear and paranoia uh, further encouraged discrimination, which were known as the yellow peril. Um, and like many Americans of color who dealt with racism and discrimination and were denied opportunities in the US, Wong left for Europe in the late 1920s, uh, where she learned to speak French and German. And she appeared in French, German, and British films. Uh, one of the films, one of the, the British films was uh, Piccadilly, which was uh, very popular at the time. Um, but with that film, despite its uh, success, it uh, still oversimplified and generalized Asian culture. Um, so upon her return uh, from Europe, not much has changed uh, back in the US. Um, in 1935, she auditioned for the lead role, Olan, in the movie adaption from Pearl S. Books, The Good Earth, uh, which ended up premiering in 1937. Um, and Wong really truly had the acting chops to play the lead, but was offered the unsympathetic concubine role, which she uh, ultimately rejected. And the lead role was given to Louise Rayner, who was made to look Asian. So um, due to uh, Wong's frustra frustrations, um, she ended up uh, retiring in the 1940s, but she, she made a comeback in the 1950s uh, where she was offered leading roles that were more representational. And then in 1961, she was offered a lead role in the film adaption of the Flower Drum Song, but unfortunately passed away at age 56 before she could truly regain her stardom. Thank you. Um... And before we before we shift gears um, and and turn the floor um, over to our colleagues, you know we'd like everybody to consider um, given given what Kaia has talked about um, and Wong's path, um, you know what are what are the ways um, that she had agency um, in her life, and I think certainly one of them was, um, you know, this idea of traveling abroad, right, um, to, to claim that agency, and I know, um, Kaya, there were a couple of other, um, a couple of other pieces that you had looked up along the way, um, right, about her production company. Yeah, so in 1924, um, Anna Mae Wong um, started a production company uh, because she really wanted to um, really offer uh, films that uh, were more representational of, of her culture. Um, unfortunately, uh, the production company uh, folded. It didn't last long due to her partner's bad business uh, practices. But um, she also, Anna Mae Wong also uh, ended up traveling to China in the late 1930s, 
for the first time to reconnect with her roots. Um, but she wasn't totally accepted there either. Um, to her surprise, she was uh, criticized for her portrayals of Chinese women. Um, and her response was an appreciation and longing for a deeper connection to her heritage uh, while she was there. Um, and she ended up making a documentary entitled The Real China to really try to uh, demystify China's image at the time. And I do want to add that um, the portrait gallery has um, additional representations and images of Anna Mae Wong in our collection um, that uh, I would love for Vanessa to put into the chat so you all can get a sense of um, some of these other images that we have of, uh, of Wong. So, um, Let's turn our attention to uh, a contemporary artwork which will allow us to explore represented, representation in a different way. Um, let's pause and think of a time um, when others didn't see you or see the real you and how that made you feel. Um, what did you do in response? and uh, consider how you actively chose to display your authentic self uh, to the world. And this is, these questions are really more rhetorical just for you to kind of reflect on. Um, and on that note, I am going to pass it on to my colleagues, Grace and Sai, uh, to take a close look at the second object. Thank you so much, Kaya and Brianna. Um, if we can go ahead and have the next slide, that would be great. Um, thank you for inviting us to be here with you and join this program. I think really interesting connections come out when we bring um, the collections of two different Smithsonian museums together. And it's it's interesting for us to look at to look at portraiture in this way with you all from the National Portrait Gallery. Um, so an image that we want to share with you tonight um, is this one. And uh, Brianna, do we actually have the next the next slide? Is it the one? Uh, let's go back one. Actually, sorry. Let's stay on this one. Okay. So um, <clears throat> if you'd like to make this image larger, you can move the gray bar on your screen uh, over so that you can see it a bit bigger. But I'd like you to just take a moment and look at this image, um, take in all the details that you can see and Note, if you'd like in the chat, anything that is really standing out to you as you first examine this image. And let's look at the next slide. You can zoom in a little bit here on the figure the figure that we see in the center. So again, just take a look. Um, note anything that is stands out to you about this figure, the person's clothing, body position, posture, style, anything that you are noticing. So someone is noticing that you can see her full body and she's looking to the side. She's looking a bit down. She's holding a bird. Her feet are bare. She has blue skin. Um, her pose almost looks like a statue. Can we move to the next slide? 
So now looking at this background behind her, which a, a few people were starting to notice, saying it looks like a mural, um, and it she's almost popping out from this backdrop. So anything else you notice about the background? Please do put it in the chat. Someone says it's um, complex, multiple images is painted in real, it looks posed, it reminds them of theater or trompe l'oeil. The building looks like it could be a temple, a temple, it's very fantastical. Almost mythical trees and plants that might be from different seasons. There's white, it almost looks like snow. Could we move on to the next slide? Okay, so now we can see the whole image here again. Um, so Sai, I wanna turn it over to you to ask us uh, another question. Yeah, so I think a few people um, have brought up a couple of these things, but based on any knowledge that you might have about Indian visual culture or Indian art, what can you infer about the figure? Who might they be? What do you think is happening? maybe what time period it might be. Or even the mood or the tone that you get from looking at it. Someone noted um, that maybe she's supposed to be Krishna, so good eye that it might be someone who's religious, um, the light blue skin. She looks like a deity or goddess. Yeah. A sense of peace or spring because of the flowers and the birds. very traditional religious art and dress. Um, so blue skin or ashen skin and this top nut hairstyle um, can suggest a religious figure. And as we noted, the title of the piece is Yogini. So a Yogini is a term used to refer to a Hindu or a Buddhist spiritual teacher or a goddess, or even just the divine feminine force in general. So, oh, she's dressed for classical Indian dance. Could we look at the next slide, Brianna? So um, we'll tell you a little more about this artist, but first we wanted to show you the historical painting that this contemporary artist was inspired by in creating this image. Um, this uh, photograph makes a specific reference to a 17th century painting from South India, uh, which you see here. So just take a minute to look and um, include any observations you might have about the, the similarities or differences you're seeing here in the chat. The, um, the contemporary artist who created this work, Pushpamala, and she followed her source material very carefully. You can see there's a red, gold, and purple outfit in both images. The woman's holding a bird in both. The landscape and the flowers and the gold background are very similar. Um, the flowing clothing um, was typical of South India at the time that the painting was made. And the figure in the painting is sort of strangely elongated. Um, she almost suggests someone who's like a, not quite a real person, maybe someone who's divine or mythical. And the painting likely was made for a, uh, a ruler um, and the flowers look, look really sort of fantastical in the landscape. Can we go on to the next slide? 
So just to, to let you know a little bit more about the artist who created this, um, Push Pamala N, and she does go by her, her first name and just her last initial. Um, she is an Indian artist who was born in Bangalore and she currently works between Bangalore and Delhi. Um, she's a video, photo, performance and installation artist, as well as a writer and curator. And since the 1990s, the main uh, key part of her practice has been creating photo tableaus where she performs in various roles. So this is actually the artist who we see here. And in this work, um, she worked with a photographer, Arnie, who she collaborated with, who was actually taking the image. Um, she makes... Um, reference to many different things in her images from art history, photography, film, theater, and popular culture. And she often collaborates with different artists and filmmakers in order to create these photo tableaus. Um, if you want to find out more about her, um, her website is in the chat. So you can really see many more of her images there, which I think will give a little more context to her work. Um, so Sai, I want to ask you uh, a question <laughs> now about this work is given our conversation this evening, um, what do you think the artist's intention was in creating this photo performance? And why do you think she titled um, the series that this is part of Native Women of South India Manners and Customs? So I think it's a a mix of different things. I think it shows how the artist is commenting on the idealization of Indian women and also misrepresentation. Um, as you mentioned that the painting that she's kind of taking her inspiration from or copying um, was painted in the 17th century. Um, and I'm gonna ask Vanessa to put in the chat uh, more images from the same series so you can take a look at different ways that Pushpamala uh, showed other Native women of South India and their representations. And I will tell you a little bit more about um, her work with Claire Arney. Uh, so from 2000 to 2004, Pushpamala N worked with the photographer Claire Arney, who took this photo and to create the whole series, Native Women of South India Manners and Customs. Uh, it comprised over 200 photographs, and the series focuses on depictions of women in historical and contemporary visual culture, colonial photography, magazine covers, paintings, film stills, popular images of goddesses, calendars, ethnographic records, news photos, and advertisements are just some of the source materials um, for the elaborate ways of restaging these studio portraits that Pushpamala put herself into and performs the role of the subject for the camera. Um, so I just wanna share a quote um, from Pushpamala and Claire about the series. The original project imagined the setting up of a fantasy photo studio, the sort of old fashioned portrait studio with painted sets and props, which even sometimes provided its customers with costumes. In this setting, we would explore and rethink popular images of South Indian women by recreating well-known images in the genre of photo performance while deconstructing them in various ways. I, that's something that I can relate to growing up as a South Indian kid in India. My parents took us to photo studios and we posed very awkwardly with backdrops and props. So those fill our family photo albums. Um, so Grace, I'm going to ask you a question. So knowing that the figure in the photograph is the artist, how do you see her creating or controlling her own representation? Well, I think that she's controlling her representation by creating a whole fantasy world here. Um, she's created this painted backdrop, this elaborate costume, her makeup, and she's posing in the image herself with this bird. Um, she's chose this source material and then sort of brought it to life. So it's her fantasy that she's pulled other people into. Um, and I think that the reason she chose this painting to recreate is it was, it's because it is um, 
fairly well known in art history. It was on the cover of a catalog of an exhibition of Indian art that took place at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, 1985. So in a way she's choosing kind of an icon of art history to play with and retell and recreate. Um, you could also note that um, many artworks left India during the British colonial period and are no longer located there. So um, this, uh, you know, could be seen as one scholar wrote about Pushpamala's work that restaging becomes an act of, reclama of reclamation. So of, of sort of taking something back. And I think this performance also really shows her freedom um, as an artist in moving between all different sorts of images and identities very fluidly. And, um, also highlighting women's power in this case is sort of spiritual or religious power. Um, and there's really a wonderful element of play and humor in her work, which is why it really appeals to me. Yeah, thank you. So I think that since we're getting close to the hour, we're going to bring us back all together to um, just spend a few moments answering our essential question, which is why does agency and representation matter? After we've, you know, learned about the biographies and about the photographers of these two pieces, how have our ideas changed? I think, um, so we've talked about the backdrops, we've talked about the figures um, and the staging. Thank you all for your comments in the chat. Um, so where do you see truth and where do you see fiction in these two photographs? And I invite Brianna and Kaia and Grace to answer that question while we get answers in the chat. I just wanted to call out a comment which um, Jan Stewart, who's our curator of Chinese art at Fierce Sackler, she made in the chat a little bit earlier about the anime Wong image that she noticed it. Or she was noticing that she thinks that um, you can see a, a Chinese ancestor portrait in behind the figure here so that it is a, a man wearing a red robe with his hand sort of coming out from the wide sleeve of the robe. Um, so I just thought that was interesting to think about that that direct reference to sort of the ancestors or those who came before, but also a fairly stereotypical and well-known sort of image that um, she might be in front of sort of representing Chinese art or Chineseness. Right, and I think, and thank you, Grace. And I think, you know, at the at the portrait gallery, one of the things that we're always thinking about um, is that that portraits do have both of those elements always, right? The fact, the truth, um, as well as the as well as the fiction. And so, I think sometimes we can think about how um, you know how subjects want to how how they want to be portrayed. Um, and we had that initial um, observation in the chat about, you know, what sort of collaboration may have happened between Wong and Murray um, and how much say. And sometimes we know um, and sometimes we don't, sometimes we don't necessarily know. It's, I, I do find it fascinating now that we have these two pieces, right, side by side. Um, and, you know, I think that we can certainly see we can certainly see these elements um, of, of truth, of, of fiction, um, and also this idea of controlling um, one's identity. Um, and I've seen that come through in the chat as well. Yeah, there's an interesting comment about um, that the Pushpamala image is, it's like a real woman coming out of the painting that it was based on. So um, it's almost come to life. But then comparing the two, they 
are both essentially sort of women dressed up standing in front of a backdrop. So they have those, um, those sort of stylistic similarities. I'm struck by the use of the word power in the chat. I think that's really interesting because I think agency and representation have a lot to do with power, right? Like who gets to decide how you're represented? Is it you or is it the person taking your photograph? And I think that's something that we see with these two objects. Definitely agree. Speaks to the power of portraiture, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and choice. Yeah. Right. And I think, right, that, um, right, so you just said that power to choose, right? That just came through um, in the chat as well. I think, well, power of, sorry. Of, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think that power to share your truth is kind of intertwined with agency. So having agency means you're able to show other people your personal truth if you get to decide how you're represented. Right, I agree, I agree. Um, as we are closing out our, um, our time together, um, we just all want to say thank you for engaging in this conversation with us. Um, you know, I think that um, I can't wait to actually just continue to go through the chat because there have been some really phenomenal comments, um, some phenomenal thoughtful observations, um, and a lot of questions. Um, and I often say that, you know, sometimes if you if you if you step away from an artwork. Um, with more questions than you have answers, um, then that's actually an okay thing, right? Because it means that you are inspired to learn a little bit more, to dig a little bit deeper. Um, you know, when Kaia and Sai and Grace and I came together to think through this program, there was a lot of back and forth about the um, who we wanted to highlight and what we wanted to highlight. Um, and, you know, the women who were featured tonight, you know, certainly understood the impacts of um, oppression, racism, discrimination, but they really did also understand the power of agency in crafting their representation. Um, and as I said, in crafting their truth. Um, so we hope that you've enjoyed this dialogue as much as we've enjoyed having um, this dialogue. Um, I just saw that my colleague Vanessa went ahead and put into the chat um, the registration pages for um, both the newsletters for the Portrait Gallery as well as the Freer Sackler um, and um, upcoming events that both museums are having. Um, the Portrait Gallery, uh, you know, this In Dialogue series is ongoing, um, and the summer sessions for In Dialogue are up on our Eventbrite page. Um, we're partnering up with Natural History next month, the Smithsonian Gardens in July, and the Asian Pacific American Center in August. Um, so we do hope that you will continue to join us. Um, and with that, I will just pop us to our last screen with our contact information um, and say thank you for joining us this evening. We appreciate that you took the time to, to be with us to talk about these two um, amazing images. Thank you all. It's wonderful to be with the Portrait Gallery tonight in this program. Thank you so much for having us. And thank you to our colleagues at First Sackler. We appreciate you.